can lift up our hands. We can lift up our voice together in one sound and one accord tonight. Jesus, we worship you. God, we praise you in this place. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, and when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all together with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Today we have that same power, we have that same ability, we are the Book of Acts Church, amen, we are the church of miracles, signs, and wonders. I'm thankful to be in the house of God tonight. Hallelujah. Let's lift up our voices together. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. Amen. As they bring all the house lights up, let's worship with the kick choir. Praise the Lord, church. I'll be reading Psalm chapter 23, 1 through 6. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, ye, thou, I will walk through the valley of the shadow of death. I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David said in verse 6, goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. The word follow me to pursue or chase. Let me tell you about the goodness of God. Two years ago on August 9th, 2020, in the middle of COVID, Jesus filled me with the Holy Ghost. During, during a tent revival. The goodness and mercy of God is here tonight, and it's chasing after you. Whatever you need from God, you can receive it. If you'll put the trust in him, worship with us as we sing. Thank you.
hallelujah, we worship you, Lord. We praise you. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. Lord, we love you and we praise you. Hallelujah. Anybody glad to be in the house of the Lord tonight? Amen. Let's clap our hands. Thank the Lord for his presence. This time, let's turn, let's, let's meet and greet one another as we prepare for service to begin.
He is not dead. Amen. We serve a living God. Hallelujah. Amen. All across this building, one more time, if you lift up your hands and worship the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the presence of the Lord is in this house tonight. Amen. Whatever you have need of tonight, amen, Jesus can meet your need.
Praise God. Amen. Well, it feels good to be in the house of the Lord, doesn't it? Even on a Tuesday night. Tired, hot, weary. But it's all right. Jesus is here. He's in the house. He said, come unto me, all ye that are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Praise God as you make your way back to your seat. Our scripture reading tonight is going to be out of the book of 1 Peter. I will begin reading at verse 13 down through 25. Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust of your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, be ye holy for I am holy. And if ye call on the Father, who without respect of persons judgeth according to every man's work, past the time of your sojourning here in fear, for as much as ye know that ye were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory, that your faith and hope might be in God, seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren. See that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. For all flesh is as grass, and all the glory of man as the flower of grass. That grass, or the grass, withereth, and the flower thereof falleth away. But the word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the word by which the gospel is preached unto you. Thank you, Jesus. Tonight, if you're with us for the first time or for the first time in a long time, we want you to know that we are so glad that you're here. Just a few quick announcements. Tomorrow night, there won't be any choir practice. There won't be any children's Bible study. But tomorrow at 10 a.m. here in the sanctuary, there will be ladies' prayer tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, after service tonight, there's going to be enchiladas, rice, and beans in the cafe. And also, if you signed up for the Catalina trip on August 6th, the deadline to turn in your money is Wednesday. So tonight, after service, Sister Crim Floyd will be in the Welcome Center finishing up collecting money if you need to pay for that. Beyond that... Return back and be with us again this Sunday at 10 a.m. and 5.30 in the afternoon for prayer and revival service. We're just excited about what God is doing in this season. I know it's hot. I know it's really nice to go to the beach, but I'm thankful to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. To be worshiping Him with my brothers and my sisters. Amen. Let's all stand as we, pray, as we prepare for tonight's tithe and offering. Ask the Lord to bless each and every one of us tonight. God, tonight we come before you in the name of Jesus. Ask you, Lord, to bless those that give, Lord, and make all this possible. We thank you for your many blessings you've given to us. We pray, God, that you would rebuke the devourer, God, that you would strengthen us and provide for us in the time of need. God, even when we go through the valley of the shadow of death, be with us, walk with us, carry us, God. We give you the glory, we give you the honor, we give you the praise. In Jesus' name, give unto the Lord.
as you lift lift up a sound to the heavens, God, you are great and greatly to be praised. God, there's freedom in this house tonight, freedom from addiction, freedom from depression, freedom from anxiety. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Jesus, we love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Anybody ready for the preaching of the word tonight? Amen. Let's welcome Brother Martin Fields tonight as he comes to deliver the word of the Lord. Let's give him a hand clap of praise. He's worthy tonight. Hallelujah, Jesus. I love you and thank you for your goodness to us. Hallelujah. I tried to wear the most uncomfortable shoes I have, and I don't have too many of them. I spent most of my day on my knees, putting in a tile floor, and I could stand for a very long time, but I promise you I won't, I won't make you stand for too long, and I won't wake you sit in your pew for too long. <laughs> um, I do, I am thankful for the opportunity to grace this pulpit I'm thankful that my brothers are here, a lot of them. Um, I can't even tell you the, the thankfulness I have for being a part of this church and being a part of these men on the platform, being a part of First Pentecostal Church with the leadership that I have. I'm thankful today. Hallelujah. I mean that. I mean that with my whole heart. I. I feel like I'm the least of these guys, but I will graciously take my spot and I'm trying to uh, give what God has given me. And I will tell you tonight, first off, that this is a message God gave me as a teenager. Um, and if I'm not mistaken, I may have preached it the first time in the old building. I was a nervous wreck. Brother Bradford had to take some time off for, for school, and Bishop was sitting in the audience watching my every move. And I was a nervous wreck. But I have pulled this out some, probably, to be honest, years ago. And in the last several months, I've been tweaking and I felt it for tonight. I had something else that I thought I really had prepared for, and it just wasn't coming together. So you're going to hear this tonight. I want to read from 2 Samuel chapter 11, and I'm going to read just the first verse. 2 Samuel 11 and 1. And it came to pass after the year was expired, at the time when kings go forth to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him and all Israel and they destroyed the children of Ammon and besieged Rabbah. But David tarried still at Jerusalem. Let's pray this evening. Jesus, we love you and thank you for this opportunity to be in your house. Grateful to you, God, because you came and visited with us, God. We felt you already in this place. I pray that you'd anoint my lips of clay tonight, God. Anoint the ears of the hearer and the hearts of the hearer, God, that they would hear and receive the word of God. We thank you and praise you. And thank you for all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. I do want to tell you on the offset, it has always amazed me to hear a sports fan talk about the teams that they like. When discussing a recent win or loss, it's quite funny sometimes to hear them talk about how we won or lost the game. I mean, I'm talking about a lot of times this is teenagers. They're talking about how we lost the game because somebody else stole the ball or we lost the game because somebody missed a free throw. If we could have just hit more free throws, if we could have caught the fly ball, if we could have blocked the field goal, as if what I contribute as a fan matters. And I've heard this time and time again, and somebody that's sitting on the sidelines, maybe not even actually in an event, but listening on the radio, and they're talking about the Dodgers or they're talking about the Lakers, and they come back and they're reciting the story back to you and saying, man, we just had the game. 
And I'm looking at, all my life I've looked at people and thought, what do you mean we? Did you shoot free throws? Did you kick a field goal in this game? But it's something that happens quite often. And, and not to say that they're bad people. They're very passionate about what they like. But I have news for people that sit in the sidelines and think that they're actually part of what's ha- taking place. I'm going to tell you something, honey. There's a lineman out there that's, that's standing on the front line saying, uh, you really ain't got nothing to do with that. what's happening down here. I'm getting hit every time. I'm getting my glasses knocked off. That happened to me here. The first football game I think we ever played with the boys, the oats, and the older guys, they would come in and just go up like this, knock my glasses off. It took me out of the, out of the game completely. I wasn't any good anyway, but it really took me out of the game. But if you're sitting drinking a Coke, you're eating popcorn, maybe a hot dog, it's far different than being on the field with the dirt in your nostrils, the mud on your uniform, the grass stuck in the face shield of your helmet, the pain of your muscles getting cramped up because you're dehydrated, the frustration of missing a tackle by a hair, or the exhilaration of making the biggest play of the game. All of these things are relative to where you are positioned during the game. And that brings me to my title, in the grandstands or in the arena. In the grandstands or in the arena. I read this text tonight, and this is a a pretty heavy text. And I'm not going to belabor the point of David's sin, but there was something that happened there. And as I read this when I was a young man, I said, I've, I've got to take notice of what is written because... There's a reason why it was written this way, and it says, and it came to pass after the year was expired at the time when kings go forth to battle. And I began to think on that and ponder that, and I realized that David took an opportunity to just bail out, or as the young people say, to dip. At that moment when kings were supposed to do their thing and they went to battle and they were going to fight battle and they were going to conquer kingdoms and and take out kings, David is sitting in his palace and he's just comfortable with what's happening. And David realizes at the moment that, that everybody's gone that I'm here and I can do whatever I please and he walks out, the Bible begins to tell about what's happening. It came to pass in an evening that David arose and walked out on his house. Now, I had a talk with Ryan Lopez after they came back from Israel, and he said he was at the place where they say David's house was. And it would have been at the top of this hill, and you could look down as like a terraced place, and you could look down, and you could see the tops of the houses. Somewhere in the recesses of my mind, something began to work, and I realized this was not the first time David had been on the top of his, or, uh, uh, on his house and looking down. This was not the first time he may have seen somebody where they were taking a bath. This was not something that was new to him. And so when I began to look at this, I recognized there, was, there were three things that can happen because of being in the wrong place at the wrong time or the wrong place at the right time. And so David, who should have been in the arena, who should have been with his men, who should have been taking out a kingdom or or fighting those that were coming against the children of Israel, he found himself in the grandstands and watching and waiting to hear news back from the warriors. And uninvolvement is the first thing I want to talk about. Temptation comes when there is uninvolvement. If you're a new person, I'm sorry, um, I'm not... I'm not trying to pinpoint anything. We, we love our, our new converts here, don't we? We love our new converts. And involvement comes with time spent here. And so if you're not involved in something yet, then, then you will be. Sooner or later, we're going to find exactly what you're good at, and you're going to wish we didn't ever ask you because we're going to keep going back to that well over and over and over. And just for the record, Sister Sandy, I watched your daughter Charlotte worship tonight and that was awesome that was awesome I just have to tell you that was one of my favorite songs and the kids did a wonderful job wonderful job and here's a girl that just got the Holy Ghost got baptized she's involved in the kick choir she's involved she's involved so temptation comes this was not a new temptation 
This is a temptation that he had, he had probably visited a few times. He walked out on his roof and he looked down and at other times when he was busy doing kingdom work and doing the things that a king does, he just overlooked it, he glossed over it and something in his heart said, that's Uriah's wife, you need to stay away from that. But this time, there was a temptation that came because of uninvolvement, because he pulled himself out of the game, because he said, I don't need to be with everybody else doing what they're doing. I don't need to do kingdom work. I don't need to go to prayer meeting. I don't need to go to Tuesday night. I don't need to be in involved in music practice. I don't have to go to choir anymore. He did something very different than what he had done in times past, and he found himself tempted. The Bible tells us in James 1.14, but every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Temptation will come when you become uninvolved. Involvement always brings you closer to the action. Involvement brings you closer to the cross. Thanks for that, because that was good. Involvement is going to bring you closer to the cross. I stood here Sunday morning, and you can ask my wife, I drove down the road weeping. The presence of God was thick Sunday morning, and it was thick Sunday night. But I stood in this altar, and I'm not, I'm not trying to embarrass or any of that, but Brother Frank is a new convert. He's, well, he's been around here a little while, but he was standing within arm's reach of me. And a song was being sung, and I remembered something an old pastor of mine said, Calvary chops the legs off of everyone. And the whole understanding of that is when we come to the cross, everybody's the same. And I thought, here I am, 50 years old. I was raised in an apostolic church, and I was weeping to a song that an ex-prisoner was weeping to. And it did something to me. It made me realize I'm no better. I'm no better. Oh, I'm thankful for, my, for, my, for the... Uh, testimony that I have that I didn't have to go to the weak and beggarly elements of the world but I'm, I'm no better than those that have walked in just yesterday and are going to walk in tomorrow and walk in next week I'm thankful for people that get involved in worship I'm thankful for people that recognize the, there's an importance of worship and praise in the middle of a service number two it brings a critical spirit 1 Samuel 17, verses 26 through 28 says, And David spoke to the men that stood by him, saying, What shall be done to the man that killeth this Philistine? And taketh away the reproach from Israel, for who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him after this manner, saying, So shall it be done to the man that killeth him. And Eliab, his eldest brother, heard what he spoke for what he spake unto the men. And Eliab's anger was kindled against David, and he said, Why comest thou, thou down hither? And with whom hast thou left those few sheep? He could have said, who, who did you leave the sheep with? But he had to point out that there was just a few sheep. Who did you leave those few sheep with? In the wilderness, I know thy pride and the naughtiness of thine heart, for thou art come down that thou mightest see the battle. Eliab is angry and critical. You might ask, why is he angry and critical? I think because his uninvolvement in what was taking place in taking down the enemy of Israel has brought him to a place of criticism. He felt the situation was impossible for him, which makes it impossible for anyone else. He's looking at the situation saying, there's no way I can go up against this, this crazy, tall maniac of a warrior. And it's amazing to me because if you go on and read that story after he is taken out, after Goliath is killed, they go on and kill so many people. They chase them to the next town. They, they literally just wipe them up and throw away the refuse. I mean, the... the it was crazy. It was a wipeout completely. It wasn't that they couldn't do it. 
It was that, that somebody wouldn't stand up and say, you know what, there's got to be a reason and a cause for what we are doing. And because they refused to do that, here Eliab is standing here saying, there's no way you can do this. It's too hard for me, which makes it too hard for you because you're just my little brother who keep a little few sheep up over there in the wilderness somewhere. And so a critical spirit will come in where there is uninvolvement. A critical spirit will come in when somebody says, you know what, I'd rather sit on the sidelines and cheer every once in a while than actually be down in the arena. Number three, a self-sufficient attitude will develop. If we look at Samson. Samson was a mighty man. Samson was anointed by God. He was used by God over and over and over. But there was something that Samson just had in his craw. He had a lust for women that were not the kind of women that he should be hanging around with. And the Bible begins to explain some of this. And women that he was involved with didn't have the same values that he had. And it's, it's amazing. I spent 20 years working with young people. And you could watch the decline of a young person when they became involved with a member of the opposite sex that had no value system or had very little compared to what they had because of the family life that they had. And you would watch this happen, and there, it was almost like there was nothing you could do. You could teach to them. You could preach to them. You could pray with them. You could pray for them. You could fast for them. You could do just about anything. But when they got something like this in their craw, they went after it with mucho gusto. This is what Samson did. Eventually, he was drawn away by his infatuation of this woman. He gave up what made him a useful tool against the enemy of his people. The Bible tells us that he went to Delilah's house. He's laying in the lap of Delilah. doesn't say he was married to her, so he shouldn't have been there in the first place. Just saying. But she began to ask him, what gives you your strength? What makes you so strong? What, what in the world makes you who you are? And he began to spin these wild tales. If you get new ropes and if you do this and you do that. And he's, he's just leading her on this wild adventure. And the more she asked, the more he kept giving these crazy stories until finally he said, okay, here's the deal. I've never cut my hair. As a Nazarite, I took a vow that I would never touch my hair. I would not cut it. I would not shave it. I will do nothing with it because I made a vow. I will not drink strong drink. I won't, I won't uh, eat the flesh of animals. I won't. I mean, he went down the line, I think. It doesn't say all that, but I think he probably told her everything and said, and if you cut my hair, it will take away all the strength that I have. And amazingly, I don't know where this cat's brain was at. But somewhere along the line, he thought that she wouldn't call in the lords of the Philistines. <laughs> I mean, she'd done it like three or four times before, and this time he thought, well, I'm going to go to sleep. She probably won't do anything about this. Oh, he did. she did. She called him, and he said, literally, I will arise, and I will defeat the enemy as I did before. He shook himself, not knowing that the power of God had left him. There's a self-sufficient attitude that says, I can do this. I've done it before. I can do this. I, I've done this my whole life. I know how to worship. I know how to praise. I know how to get in an altar and pray with people. I know, and you can, the list is long of all the things you can say, oh, I know how to do that. I can teach Sunday school. I can, but if you're relying on your own self, Instead of relying on a God that begins to work on your mind, it begins to work in your heart and begins to bring you things to remembrance. It's just self-sufficiency and it does me no good. So you, you're probably sitting there, a lot of you, saying, okay, well, that's the negative part. So is there anything positive? <laughs> And there is. I'm glad you asked. 
how do we combat these deficiencies that are not of God? I'm going to say this three times so you remember. First and foremost, get involved. Get involved. Get involved. It's good to see Darren Shepherd here tonight. Saw you the other day. That's awesome. If you're involved, guess what? Your, your mind is going to be on the things that you're involved in. And if you're involved in the kingdom of God, your mind's going to be on the kingdom of God. Find something to do. The wise men in Ecclesiastes 9 says, whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might. Get involved in the kingdom of God. Don't look back. Don't, don't say, hey, yeah, I'd like to do something. And they say, well, you know what? This is a true story. My, this guy, <laughs> I got to tell this story. My dad was a pastor, and this guy says, I have a week off, and we we're supposed to go on vacation, and we're not going on vacation. We're going to stay here. Is there anything that I can do around the church? He said, yes. He said, both the toilets and the men's and women's restroom are not working properly. He said, oh, Brother Fields, I, I, I would rather not do any of that. If you're asked to clean the bathrooms, clean the bathrooms. I've seen a lot of young men that want to get up here and do this, and they won't touch a toilet brush. They won't hug that toilet and clean behind it really well and do all the stuff that has to be done when you walk into a bathroom. But I can guarantee you when people walk into this place, they're coming back again because when they walk in, it smells good, it looks good, it's not dirty because somebody cares enough to do a job. Get involved and do something. Do it over and over and over again. Do it until it becomes something that it doesn't even bother you to go and do it. Hey, hey, I'm going down to the church to clean. What? What in the world, dude? I'm going over here to pick up some ice cream. That's all right. I'm going to go clean the church. Why? Because somebody cares enough and loves the kingdom of God so much, they'll do things in the kingdom of God to stay busy. When you're busy, you won't have time to sit and ponder some of life's frustrations. Those life's frustrations, I'm going to leave at that because I'm not pastor. Fighting a critical spirit. 1 Corinthians 14 deals with spiritual gifts and prophesying or speaking in tongues more directly. Paul tells them in this passage of scripture, I'd rather say five words to, that you all understand than 10,000 words in an unknown tongue. He's talking about the importance of, of prophesying and speaking in tongues and all of that, but when it comes down to understanding one another and edifying one another, I would rather say five words to you that you understand than 10,000 that you don't. Sometimes people walk away and say, man, what, what just happened in there? Well, somebody didn't follow after 1 Corinthians 14 where it says, I would rather give you five words that you could understand. And so he's saying that we should seek to edify each other in the house of God. Verse 26 admonishes this very thing, to edify one another. A critical spirit naturally tears down, but we are called as Christians to edify one another and to build one another up. Instead of being critical, stop. Just stop for a second when you find something to criticize because I can do that all day long. I catch myself sometimes, somebody does something that does a little different than I think could have been done there. And I'm like, wow. And I got to stop and tell myself, that's not you. They're their own separate person, and that's maybe the way they do things. And so it's easy for us to be critical. How do I fight that? I've got to get involved in the kingdom of God and recognize that my job as a Christian is to edify and build up and encourage people. Ephesians 4, 29 and 32 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace unto the hearers, and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice, and be ye kind one to another." Tender harder, forgiving one another, even as God for Christ's sake hath forgiven you. I saw something this week. 
or last week, I think, on social media. I struck a chord, and I, I happen to know who the guy is that said it. Some of you may, some of you may not, some of you may have seen it. Church members get more upset over sound, temperature, and music styles than empty prayer rooms, altars, and baptistries. I realized, I realized as I read that quote, when we are focused on prayer and discipling people, we are far less likely to be critical of the other things that are mentioned here. God help us if our altars are empty. God help us if our baptistry doesn't get water put into it. God help us if nobody knocks the door or teaches a Bible study. I like big pulpits because sometimes you can say something and duck behind it so you don't see the dirty looks. This one, I would have no, no luck here. But sometimes we become so critical of the weirdest, menial thing. Why did they build the wall here? <laughs> Why did they build a cafe? Why do they have big chairs? Why do they have a big screen? God forbid, as somebody focuses on that, and if the baptistry is dry and the altars are empty, I would to God that somebody would sit in the pew and begin to cry out, why is our altar empty? Why is the baptistry dry? Why are there no new babies being baptized in the name of Jesus and nobody speaking in tongues in the altars? Why in the world are people not teaching Bible studies? If you want to get critical about something, why don't you look that way and say, we need more Bible studies, we need more baptisms, we need more Holy Ghost in feelings. <laughs> we need a positive outlook on everything around us. Paul told the church at Philippi in Philippians 2, 14, do all things without murmurings and disputings. Do all things. This doesn't really leave any room for interpretation. Well, if you look back at the text and, and you begin to do some research, I'm afraid that Paul just looked at a group of people and said, I know your inclinations. I know what you, will, what you would probably normally do is to criticize and look down your nose but at this point in time you need to understand something everything that you do needs to be done without murmurings and disputings and so this is how I begin to fight a critical spirit I've got to find a reason to get back to an altar I've got to find a Bible study to teach. I've got to find somebody hungry for the word of God. I've got to find somebody that wants change in their life. It's involvement and fighting back a self-sufficient attitude. The world has made self-sufficiency a religion almost, an attitude that comes with it like, if you're not self-sufficient, you'll never survive. Self-sufficiency is a code word for pride. Pride. The word of God tells me, and my pastor who said that Calvary chops the legs off of everyone, said that the very middle of the Bible was Proverbs 16, 18. There's as many scriptures before it as there is after it. I don't know if that's true or not. I would think that he probably wouldn't tell a lie. But it says, pride goeth before destruction and an haughty spirit before a fall. We can be more influenced by the logic of self-sufficiency than we are willing to admit. We must look at scripture and examine ourselves. We must acknowledge our dependency on the master. Without the master, I'm not here. Without the master, there is no music. There's no people in the pew. There's no gospel. 
There's no preacher to be heard. Without the master, we have nothing. Without Jesus Christ, the Almighty, we have nothing. And so we've got to understand that our dependency, you know, the world says, well, you use him as a crutch. Oh, this is not a crutch. I'm right in the wheelchair, okay? <laughs> there ain't much good here. There's not much good here. I'm in the wheelchair. He, he's got to push me around and make me look good because there is no way that I could be anything in the house of God without him. There's no way I would be a good man and work a job and make a living for a family without him. There's no way I could be a, a, a husband. I hope it's a good one. To that wonderful lady sitting right there, there's no way that I could be a good father to three wonderful children without him. So put me in the wheelchair and let him push me around. I'm okay with that. If you don't want a crutch, that's fine. But I'm completely dependent on Jesus Christ because I know what he's done for me. Peter saw the folly of being sufficient, self-sufficient in Matthew chapter 26, verses 33 through 35, and the music can come. It says, Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, that this night before the cock crow thou shalt deny me thrice. Peter said unto him, Though I should die with thee, yet will I not deny thee. Likewise also said all the disciples, Given the opportunity to pass this test, Given the opportunity to pass this test, he failed. Self-sufficiency self was not what made him. It was his dep dependency on God. James 1.17 says, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. I need him. Without him, there's no good in me. 1 Peter 4.11, if any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Psalm 116.12 and 13, what shall I render unto the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. And what is the psalmist saying here? I will take the cup of salvation. He's saying, I will lift up my cup. Why? Because he understood that only God could feel that cup. The psalmist wasn't talking about going out to the street and lifting a cup for alms. He didn't go to his friends and say, here, his friends would have said, what's, what's the cup for? Did you bring anything to put in it? But he said, I lift up my cup because I know that he can feel my cup. When you're empty, there's a God that says, I can feel that. When you feel like you've been in a dry desert for way too long, he says, I can fix that. When you feel like nobody cares about your situation and where you are in life, God says, I can do that. I can take care of all of that if you just lean on me, if you just trust me, if you just come to me, if you allow me to do it, I will do everything that you ask of me. Only God can give you what you need to survive. Most of my life until I was about 18 my father was my pastor and I can say that my, past, my dad my pastor always had a vision always had a dream of doing something and I believe when he was in the Dalles, Oregon, when I was about 9 to 12, I received the Holy Ghost in that little town. He wrote this, I don't guess it would really be considered a poem, but kind of 
and it is titled In the Grandstands or in the Arena. Are you in the grandstands or in the arena? In the bleachers or on the playing field? A spectator or a participator? Each one has its challenges. Each one has its rewards. In the grandstands, all that is required is that you watch from a safe distance with maybe an occasional boo or cheer. In the grandstands, you can decide which side you will support. You may even switch sides in the middle of the game depending on who is winning. In the arena, you feel the heat, smell the dust, and taste the sweat. Mind and muscle poised and alert, waiting for an opportunity to strike or defend. You see in the arena, you're committed for the duration of the contest. In the grandstands, you may celebrate with the winners, the ones who win the battle and wear the crown. But in the arena, you may know firsthand both the taste of victory and defeat, but your greatest reward will be wearing the crown. I don't know about you, I don't want to find myself in the position that David was in. I don't want to find myself sitting on the sidelines when just a few steps away is the arena, is involvement, is a job to do in the kingdom. Oh, I'd much rather be one that says, man, I hit the winning free throw tonight than the guy that sat there and threw popcorn all over the place and drank a Coke and ate a hot dog and spilled it all down the front of him and said, man, we won the game tonight. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. Your team won the game. And I'm, I'm happy for you because you like that team. But if you're one of the players and you won the game, I've seen the pictures of people that win championships after a long year, and the first thing that happens is tears of joy begin to run down the face of somebody that has been in the middle of it. Their muscles hurt. They have broken things. They have, they have endured a full season, and something about sweet victory. Can I tell you that at the end of all of this, when I stand before my God, and he gives me a crown of righteousness. I would much rather be one that got involved in the kingdom of God and be able to throw that back down at, the, at, the, at his feet than to be one of those that came to an apostolic church and sat there for 30 or 40 or 50 years and became so uninvolved that they became critical. And when it came to judgment, they stand there and say, oh, I did this, this, and this. And they begin to go down the line of all the things that they did. And God says, I don't know who you are. I want to be involved in the kingdom of God. I want to see people come to an altar and receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. I want to sit in my living room and give Bible studies to people that say, I I'm pretty sure I spoke in tongues. I started talking funny. And she recognized her need to be baptized in Jesus' name. And I got to see her go down in a watery grave. I would much rather do that than to be critical of every new change that happens in the house of God. Because you know what? 20, uh, 1920, I probably wouldn't have recognized what church was. 1960, I wouldn't recognize what a church was altogether. But from the time I was young till now, I still see that it's the house of God. And oh, we sing some different songs, and that's okay. I like the old ones and I like the new ones. But when I take my focus off of my opinion and I recognize this is the kingdom of God. And I'm looking for somebody that's hungry for the word of God and hungry for a change in their life and hungry just to be in a place that there's peace and love and joy, things that I've never experienced ever in my life. I watch as people, multiplicity of people, and I'm not trying to embarrass, but as I was down here, I looked at a, at a man with tears streaming down his face and I watched as praise singers stood with hands upraised, singing a song 
of praise with tears streaming down their face because I know the story of some of these people and I know that they've had some struggles, but they're saying, you know what, God, I'm thankful. I'm thankful for your mercy and I'm thankful for your grace and I'm thankful just to be able to be involved in the house of God. As we stand tonight, I would I wish that all of us would come down here, make a recommitment tonight to say, you know what, I'm going to find something to do in the house of God. I'm, I'm going to be involved to the point that, that I can look beyond all of the things that are maybe just a little bit different. Maybe I can get so close to the cross that all I can see is Jesus. Maybe I can get so close to him and I can feel his heartbeat and understand that if I stay close to him, I'll see through his eyes. I'll know what he feels. I'll know what he wants me to feel. I'll know what he wants me to do. Let's worship him tonight as they sing a song of invitation.
Step forward. The ministry is here to help you pray. Amen. In Jesus' name, we come before you right now in the name of Jesus, God, for everyone that's going to step forward, believing in faith for healing. Tonight, Jesus, we believe, Lord, that you can heal every sickness and every disease. Tonight, Lord, we pray for everyone that comes forward, God. Whatever's going on in their mind, whatever's going on in their body, whatever's going on in their life, God, you are wonderful. You are counselor. You are the everlasting God. You are the everlasting Father. You are the Prince of Peace. Tonight, God, as we pray, I pray that prayers would be answered. Lord, I pray that your will would be done in the name of Jesus. Lord, you're faithful to those that are faithful to you. Tonight, God, we pray, Lord, that you would answer the prayers of our sisters, answer the prayers of our brothers. We believe it in faith tonight, God, that you're exceedingly, abundantly able to do above what we're able to ask or think, God. Lord, you are in this place tonight, answering every need, God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, God's Spirit is in this place tonight. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Liberty means freedom. There's freedom from sickness, freedom from pain, freedom from fear. Amen. Lift up your hands tonight and receive it in the name of Jesus. There's healing for back pain in the house of God tonight. Oh, there's healing for anxiety in the house of God tonight. There's healing for high blood pressure in the house of God tonight. Oh, there's healing for the brokenhearted in the house of the Lord tonight. In the name of Jesus, we speak the word of faith over every situation. We speak the word of faith in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus.
this house. Let's put our hands together and thank the Lord for his presence tonight. Lord, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for the word of the Lord that we've heard. We thank you for the spirit that we feel in this house. Uh, God, I pray that your presence would continue to rest upon each and every one of us this week as we go. Let your angels be a hedge all around us. God, keep us and protect us, Lord, this week. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody says amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be dismissed. Enchilada rice and beans in the cafe.